so how do you solve beta-like theory questions on your corporate finance course, your introduction to finance course? This is exactly what this video wants to do. It wants to give you a little bit of points of references that you could use to master these theory questions that you're probably going to face on your exam. Okay, so let's go right to it. So as you can see on your screen, we're looking at this concept of evaluating beta. Okay, and all these different questions will be theory based. And they're going to really question your understanding of the underlying concepts dealing with beta. So let's look at A through D and let's try to make sense of the different concepts that they're, that they're bringing about and see how they relate to our understanding of CAPM. So under CAPM, when the beta of a security is equal to 1, okay, the expected return of the security is the return of the market portfolio. Okay. Now, there are two ways to interpret this question. One, by looking at the graph of the SML. And one, by looking at the equation or the formula of the SML. And we're going to do both. So first and foremost, the graph of the SML looks like this. All right. The graph of the SML looks like this, and it shows us something super important. It tells us that the market portfolio or the market security has, okay, has a beta of one. All right, so that's super duper important. The graph tells us that no matter what, the market portfolio has a beta of one because obviously the total market will contribute to the total variance of the market. And that's something that's much more in depth. You don't have to worry about that too much. What you do want to know is that our function or our formula is just like this. Okay? And that formula says that B, beta, is your X, or essentially what lies on your horizontal axis, and that your slope is equal to the market risk premium. So let's start by looking at our graph. And our graph makes something super duper obvious to us. It tells us that when B, or beta, is equal to 1, that's the point at which we're dealing with our market portfolio okay is the point at which we're dealing with our market portfolio so already just by doing that just by looking at our graph it becomes painfully obvious to us that under cap m when the beta of a security is equal to one then the expected return will probably be equal to the same thing as if you beta was already one okay and you could do this as a proof and you could set all of your different variable all of your different variables of your SML and you could just try to play with beta essentially filter throughout the whole horizontal axis and you would see that no matter what if you put your beta as 1 and you say that the security has that same beta then you will see that k will be equal to ERM and that's a case in which we would say typically that this is fairly valued and by simply looking at the graph at the graph of our SML, we really quickly know that beta for the market portfolio is equal to one. Okay, so that's super duper important. I'll tell you why in a second. And by looking at the equation of the SML, which is K equals RF plus beta times ERM minus RF, the market risk premium, we, quick, we quickly see that if all else is the same, so the market risk premium and RF, we know that by just playing with B, because it's a linear function, we'll be able to find different Ks, right? Just by, you know, filtering through all the different betas available, we're going to get a different K. But if we're telling you that beta, in this case, for the security is equal to 1, then for sure, we're going to have a case in which ERM is equal to RF. And because we know that the market portfolio has a beta of 1, therefore, it's obvious that its ERM will be the same as a security that has a beta of 1. So in this case, A is totally true. Now let's consider B, in which we tell you that under cap M, when the beta of a security is equal to 0, so a beta of a security is equal to 0, the security has no risk. And this is something that you're definitely going to see on your exam, and they're going to try to mess with you. But you need to remember that under cap M, 
there is no such thing as, el as eliminating all of the risk. There is a part of unique risk that you could eliminate, but this idea of non-diversifiable risk, which is the market risk, could not be eliminated. So a scenario in which you have a beta of zero, right, a beta of zero, would actually not be possible. Well, not, it would not be the case that you would have no risk. You would just have zero unique risk. You would still have the market risk, which is dealt by every different positions that you could take. All right, so with that being said, saying that under CAPM, when the beta of the security is equal to zero, the security would have no risk. Well, that's actually false. That's not true. Typically, under C, one could argue that the beta of a portfolio is equal to the average of the betas of its individual stocks. So essentially, what we're saying here is that we're telling you that beta of a portfolio is equal to the weighted average of its betas. And that's totally true. The beta of a portfolio is actually equal to the weighted average of its betas. So in this case, one could definitely argue that that's the case. Therefore, C is true. And then we have D, in which it says that stocks with the same total risk can have different betas, and that's totally true. Stocks could have the same total risk, but, say, but different betas. And betas, essentially, as I said, aren't the same thing as risk, essentially, because risk includes unique and market risk. Whereas beta only deals with market risk. Yeah. So D is really interesting because it discusses this underlying concept of beta. And people may try to solve this through a bunch of different ways, but I feel like the most intuitive way to look at it is by understanding what beta is all about. So let's look at D. D says that stocks with the same total risk can have different betas. And this is really, really cool because beta, at the end of it all, and this is something that you're gonna need to understand, especially for your further courses in finance, if that's your major, you need to understand what beta is all about. And beta, essentially what it says, is that we're looking at how much a specific security, okay, or you know, position contributes to the variance of the market. So we're trying to see how does the standard deviation or the risk of that specific security contributes to the market variance. We wanna to see to what extent does it actually contribute to the market variance. So the total market variance is something that we definitely could see, which is equal to this much. We wanna know, well, to what extent does our security, that one specific security, actually contributes to the total variance of the portfolio. So essentially what we're looking at is like, okay, well, for sure, we could have, you know, BCE, which is Bell, it could have its stock, and it could have, you know, a, a, a risk of 17%, and I don't know if that's actually factual, but it could have any, a, any given level of risk, and then we could look at AMC, all right, which for some reason would also have a risk of 17%. But the idea is that both of them contribute differently to the total variance of the market because they have a different market share or they have a different market capitalization. They don't actually contribute to the same level to the variance of the portfolio. And if you think about it, well, bigger companies will have a bigger say on the variance of the, of the market portfolio. And you know, smaller companies, but with huge variances may also have a different impact on the market variance. So that's the best way to look at this. So for sure, you could have the same level of risk but you could definitely have a different beta because we want to see to what extent do you contribute to the market variance. And for that reason, stocks could definitely have the same total risk, but actually different betas. And for that reason, D is totally true. So this video tries to give you a better understanding of how to answer beta-like questions on your exam, especially theory questions, because this is something that teachers and you know schools definitely like to throw at you. And being able to kind of understand the general concepts applied to beta, especially in an introduction to finance course, will really empower you to do well on your exam. And I hope this was able to help you out. And, you know, if you need more content, you can definitely go through the rest of my videos in this crash course or on YouTube, or definitely go through my notes on eastmahelps.com, which could be slash home 308, 
or slash imperfectfinance. And once again, I really hope this helped you.